headed down to Acapulco. I know I'm headed down to Acapulco with the long wax hands where I might have a chance. Yeah, I'm going to head down to Acapulco. Jihad Bandari, welcome. Jim, go ahead and put that on. We good? Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a question for you. How many of you were in my talk the day before yesterday? Okay, quite a few of you. So um, I, in my last talk the day before yesterday, I talked about the West. And I talked about where the West is going and why, in my view, the West will continue to decay and degenerate for a very long time, and this takes an enormous amount of time. Thank you. I said in that speech that the reason the decay has started is because the forces of irrationality has taken over the governance of the West. And the symptom of that is in the negative yielding economic structure that you now have in the West. In my view, the negative yielding economies of the West will stay there. The Western economies will stagnate because culturally and intellectually, the West has stagnated. Now, today I'm going to talk about the rest. And what I mean by the rest is virtually everything outside the Western civilization. The Western civilization here is uh, North Europe, North America, perhaps Australia and New Zealand. Now, the context I'm going to talk, use to talk about this is the concept of negative yields and India's love for gold. I have only 20 minutes. I can't talk about the whole of the rest, but I'm going to talk about India quite a bit here. There's a question here I, I have been asking myself. I work in the gold industry, um, and I've never been a gold bug. Um, I actually dislike the concept of gold, and I hope uh, we, didn't, we had a better way to save our money. But the question that comes to my mind oft, often is, why do people buy gold? And different kind of explanations are given to you why people buy so much gold in certain countries, in Saudi Arabia, in Yemen, in Bahrain, in Pakistan, in India, in Bangladesh, Myanmar, Thailand, Sri Lanka, they buy an enormous amount of gold. Why? Is it inflation? Is it deflation? Is it traditions or love for gold? In my view, all these reasons play a part behind why they buy gold. But the real reason why they buy gold is because their economies are negative yielding economies. Now, I work in the financial industry, and a lot of my friends uh, did not even know the concept of negative yields. This concept has existed forever in the Middle East and in, Asia, in Southeast Asia. Let me just, for those who don't understand the concept, let me just define this in my words. A negative yielding economy is one in which your savings, your investments, instead of growing up in size, actually reduce in size. The motivation of an investor or a person with economics financial surplus is no longer in such an economy to grow his capital, his motivation is to protect as much of his capital as he can. I just wanted to define this thing before I uh, went ahead. But I'm going to break my talk in these three or four subsections. I want to define what I see as the state, what is happening in the rest. As I said, it, and that does not make makes me an expert, but I just wanted to let you know, I travel about eight to 10 months a year. I go around the world several times a year. I have lived in many countries, and I have been to over 70 countries. Um, and of course, that doesn't make me an expert. Now, why do I so simplistically, seemingly so simplistically, 
put all these bunch of countries in the rest? Why should I differentiate them so much from the West? There's something, ladies and gentlemen, that happened in the West about 2,500 years back, which distinguished humanity from the animal kingdom. The Greco-Roman philosophers found a concept. They invented a concept called the reason. The reason, the concept of reason using the vehicle of Christianity. It took a long time for reason to get infused into the culture and the psyche of the Western civilization. It took it perhaps 1,500 years to start becoming visible in the Western society. And that ha started happening about a millennia back. You had Renaissance, you had the age of reason, you had the Industrial Revolution, you had the Scientific Revolution, and then you had the Age of Enlightenment. What you see in the West, the economic and intellectual progress of the, of the West is based at the very roots, is based on the concept of reason. Now, the rest, which I said is pretty much everything outside the West, has been interacting with the West for the last 200 to 500 years now. And there has been an enormous amount of interaction because of internet and telephony over the last three decades. But unfortunately, I have a sad thing to tell you. The concept of reason continues to be a predominantly a Western phenomenon. If you travel in the rest, you realize that Mostly, there is no concept of argumentation, discussion, philosophy, and reasoning. I want to talk about a specific example of the rest, India, a country where I still spend a lot of time, a country where I grow up, where there is no nothing called philosophy. Uh, I want to show what a negative yielding economy is like, and I want to more fundamentally talk about the cultural underpinning, what makes negative yielding economy possible? So let's, let me give a portrayal of what the rest looks like to me. Over the last 30 years, three decades, the rest has developed enormously in economic terms. There has been huge amount of growth in the rest in the last 30 years. Now you ask institutional, um, international institutions, World Bank, IMF, US government, UK government, Euro, Euro Bank, and they will all attribute huge economic growth in the rest to three things basically. Economic liberalization, democracy, and public education. And ladies and gentlemen, that's a myth. Economic liberalization, yes, some of these countries gave up some of their oppressive regulations, but then they enforce 10 times more oppressive regulations elsewhere. Democracy, I won't dwell on it much, but, um, and I talked about a lot about it the day before yesterday, but democracy has been a disaster for the rest. It has politicized the, the, the rest, and it has corrupted the mentality of the masses in the rest because they see democracy as a magic wand that gets them something for nothing. And that's the problem you see on the streets in the Middle East today and a lot of other places in the rest. Uh, public education. Now, what happens with public education when you don't have the concept of reason and critical thinking? You accept public education, you go to schools and universities and accept what is taught, so-called taught there, as another set of superstitious beliefs. That's all public education is in most of the rest. So in, in summary, the rest failed to become rational despite the huge amount of interactions with the West. 
and has actually been burdened by more beliefs because of public education and democracy. But my guess is, and I hope I'm wrong here, that they have been disincentivized from learning the concept of reason because they have become rich without developing the concept of reason. But I hope I eventually get proven wrong. But anyway, I have only 10 minutes left, so I'm going to hurry up. Let's look at Indian economy. And I'm talking, going to talk about four parts of the Indian economy very quickly to show you what a negative yielding economy is about. What happens to a, an Indian who exists with a surplus? What does he do with his excess money? Let's look at the Indian property market. The rental yield per year from investing in Indian property is about 2%. And that is before you amount, account for taxes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and a huge risk you run in terms of losing your property to your tenants. Now, remember, I said 2%. The inflation rate in that country is more than 8% typically. So whatever way you do your math, it's a, you lose your money going forward, investing in property in that country. Let's look at the stock market. The earnings yield, which is the money that you earn on the current share price of in the stock market, your earnings yield is about 5%. But ladies and gentlemen, remind yourself the inflation is 8%. It's a waste of money investing in the stock market there. But it gets much worse because dividend yield in that country is less than 1%. Uh, but let's talk about the cattle market. And you might be wondering, why cattle? Because 60 to 70% of Indians still work in the agricultural sector. Cattle market gives me numbers to show up, talk about the economy in the rural sector. There are 280 million cattle in that country. It's a very liquid market. Look at these numbers. When you invest in cattle, you lose money. So ladies and gentlemen, now you are an Indian sitting in India. What do you do? You buy gold. In my view, that should never have existed. You sh it's a barbarous relic. You should, never had to, you should never have had to invest in gold. But we have to invest in gold rather than in manufacturing and infrastructure. So the, this is the number, 68% of Indian savings, household savings, 68% goes into empty properties and gold, which sits and does nothing, actually does nothing. Keynesians, I think, are right in that way. Gold does nothing for you. Look at these women. What are they doing? When, men and women, sorry. Um, and any rational person should be questioning, why should I be buying gold and empty property, not buying tractors, or put, set up manufacturing plants, or why not set up infrastructure in that country where there's virtually no infrastructure? OK, so let me get to the underpinnings here. I have already defined that it's a very uncompetitive economy. Uh, it's a negative yielding economy. Why should I be investing in manufacturing and infrastructure in that country? It's very hard to protect your savings in that country. And I have yet to meet a public servant in India who does not manipulate me, trouble me to get bribes. I have not yet met a single public servant in that wretched country who does not ask for bribes. OK, so this is all good for anarchists and libertarians. They are happy listening up to here. But there's worse here, ladies and gentlemen, because corruption in the government is only the tip of the iceberg. The poison that creates the government comes from the society, comes from your culture. It's an extremely corrupt country culturally. So in a cocktail party, for example, I might meet someone who would come and brag about the fact that he stole someone's property and got away with it. And for him, it's a matter of pride. 
Now, why would this such a thing happen in that society? Because, ladies and gentlemen, there is no concept of reason. If you don't have con concept of reason, you don't have concept of compassion, respect for the individual, res none of the Ten Commandments exist in a society that does not have reason. Right and wrong has no, dif you can't differentiate when you don't have the concept of reason in the society. The people in such a society exist in superstitions and irrationality. Now, you might think that you can, World Bank and IMF can throw billions and billions of dollars to so-called educate them, and they have done this in Afghanistan. It doesn't work, because everything sits without the foundations of reason and critical thinking. Without that, nothing gets absorbed. And the result is an economy that's negative yielding. So let me conclude here. This is my last slide. Um, I have five minutes. I'll be happy to take questions for the rest of the time. Um, in my view, reason is the organizing principle of the society. Of Reason is the glue that allows accumulation of economic, financial, and intellectual capital. Without reason, the natural state of the universe is entropy. Things tend to get dissipated and disappear. It's a lack of reason why so much of the rest is wretched, does not add to its economic growth, does not develop, and the rest is mostly stagnating. And I forgot to uh, say one thing earlier in my earlier slide. Why did actually the rest grew so hugely for the last three decades. And the reason I attribute to that is something completely different from what most people believe in. The reason the rest developed so rapidly over the last three decades was because of one thing, and that was the advent of telephony and internet. Telephony and internet set up pipelines to transport at a very rapid rate technology to be copied in the rest from the West. They copied technology and creativity of the West to the rest, but unfortunately, all those low-hanging fruit are gone, and the rest is stagnating. But there's, a re there's, there's a, something for Western people to ponder over this thing, because the fact that the West is becoming increasingly a negative yielding economy is a symptom of the fact that intellectually and culturally you are stagnating from a very low base. You are becoming more and more like India and the Middle East and the Southeast Asia. So that's all I wanted to say and I wanted to talk about, show you this slide. Thank you very much for your time. If, if there are questions, I'll be happy to address them. Okay, we have two minutes. If you have some questions. Yes, sir. How can one inculcate reason? Uh, I have no, uh, no I, I haven't a clue. I have, um, so I, in my, I'm 48 years old, and I have been able to change minds of uh, tens of people in North Europe and Western people. Uh, but I, my success with Indians is exactly zero. Uh, I don't know how to inculcate reason in a society. It's an extremely, extremely hard job. It took the West about two millennia to infuse the concept of reason in the Western society. And a lot of Western people think they take reason for granted. They think it's a simple thing. It's not a simple thing. It takes generations, generations, and centuries. So I think that's what it will take probably. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, I had a follow-up question to what he was saying. Um, on the West, what role does the postmodern school of absurdism play into the irrational uh, symptoms in the West? Can you, can you attribute any to that? Repeat the question. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. Um, if you're, I don't know if you're aware of the, politi uh, the social political movement of absurdism. <laughs> OK. Yes. Okay. Sure, yeah, I mean, I, I talked about this. The, so the question is how, how this, uh, the movement of absurdity in the West is destroying the West. And I talked about it the day before yesterday. 
the forces of irrationality have taken over institutional control of the Western institutions. And that's your biggest problem. And this will not end until democracy has ended, because democracy is an institution of the masses. Masses decide who runs your major institutions. And masses cannot think about tomorrow. They think about their animal instincts. They are driven by their animal instincts. They are not driven by planning for tomorrow. And those people who cannot plan for tomorrow should not have the right to vote, should not be deciding on how governance is run in any society. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to be a fly, I want to the Mexican sky. By the 21st century, the statists had taken over the world. After 9-11, the savage union of the war on terror and the war on drugs squelched the last flickers of freedom. Central banking-backed wars raged. Violence, imprisonment and theft had become the norm. Not many could see any other way. Hope vanished. But then, when things looked their darkest, something happened. A surprise. And just in time. From the valleys, fjords and suburbs rose the anarchists. From the cities, factories and the dark web came the anarcho-capitalists. And from every other nook, corner, cranny and drum circle, the voluntarists. Some said it was too little, too late. The war had already been lost. You can't change the system, they cried. And the anarchist answered, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. One rule to heal the world, one rule that binds them, one rule sets their moral compass and aligns them. The N-A mother fucking P. And with that, they gather again, as they do every year, in Acapulco, Mexico, this coming February, for the third annual Anarchapulco. Speakers include Larkin Rose, Jeffrey Tucker, Jeff Berwick, Adam Kokesh, Milo Yiannopoulos, Lauren Southern, Luke Radowski, Julia Toriansky, Roger Ver, Rick Falkfinger, Dana Martin, Judd Weiss, Max Egan, Josie Wales, That Guy T, Anarchy Girl, Sasha Daygame, Barry Cooper, Mark Victor, Trace Mayer, Ian Freeman and Mark Edge, Rosalind Ross, Tim Moen, Dan Dix, Dale Brown, Christopher David, Stephanie Murphy, Derek J. Freeman, Derek Bros, and many, many more. The headline musical act will be Eric July and Backwards. In and around the event will also be the Dola Vigilantes Internationalization and Investment Summit, Change Media University, and the world's largest ayahuasca ceremony held by Barry Cooper, Ayahuasca Polco. Plus, Terry Brock's Fund Your Freedom entrepreneurial course, Adam Kokesh's homesteading workshop, Sasha Daygame's Anarchy in Relationships course, Dana Martin's Free Your Family workshop, and much, much more. And it will all be held the last week of February 2017 in Acapulco, Mexico at the five-star Mundo Imperial Resort and Convention Center. Go to anacapulco.com to stake your place in history. The world might just never be the same. Evacuate the state. Brave the future.